Welcome back to our FDRX7 build presented by Turn 14 Distribution, where today we are finishing this build, including the all important wheel reveal. As you can see, our freshly built 13B is pretty much ready to party, but we are waiting for a base map before we can do first startup. And that means we've got some time to kill here, PT. And as a result, we are gonna just finish everything else on here, starting with the suspension. So let's get this car up in the air and take off these horrible old Mazda 3 wheels and get all this old suspension junk out of there. And there you have it, the front corner is as refreshed as we are going to refresh it, starting with StopTech Sport rotors and brake pads. And no, we're not gonna go to concourse, you know, restoration levels on this one, everybody. This is a, a four episode build. We're trying to speed up these builds and part of that means not refinishing every nut and bolt and not recoding calipers and stuff like that. But we're still putting lots of good stuff on here. So we do want it to be a really solid driver and a fun driver. For coilovers, we have of course gone with Fortune Autos as you saw, and these are their 510s, which is their uh, single adjustable track fo focused coilover system. And uh, they have really nice double digressive valving. So you get that good high speed uh, compression over bumps that doesn't you know, upset the chassis too much with uh, good low speed compliance as well. So you can street drive on these, they're gonna be firm, but in our experience, they actually drive really nicely on the streets and give you that nice high speed compression response on the racetrack. So big fan of the 510s. And uh, it's worth noting too that we're not changing out any of the control arms because this car comes with adjustability everywhere already. You've got eccentric bolts for uh, camber and toe up front. You've got eccentric bolts in the back for camber as well as an adjustable toe arm. So it's good to go. And having looked at the bushings on this car, like a lot of rotary cars, 
probably not a lot of mileage on this car, PT, so the bushings all look pretty good. However, it's also an old car and things do start to rot out. Like this clutch line, you can see is a cracked up mess and uh, Core Components sent us not only a clutch line, which we've replaced, a nice braided stainless steel one, but you also saw we did the braided stainless steel brake lines from Core Components. The OE brake lines looked okay, but they're old and you, they're gonna start to look like this soon, so there's just no point in risking it. You'll also have noticed that we did replace the outer tie rod ends and that's because the boot was cracked and uh, there was a ton of dirt and stuff in there, so new tie rod ends and we did inspect this front lower outer ball joint, but it's still in good condition. However, if it's gone bad, you can't just replace that. You actually have to like replace the whole lower arm. Dude, it's 750 bucks. Yeah, big, big investment. However, it is worth noting that Core Components sent us these, and this is a replacement unit. It does require some work. You gotta get out like the angle grinder and stuff and get in there to get this, get the old one out and get this one in there. But it is a more affordable way to replace that lower ball joint. And as you can see, they offer them in different lengths which would let you adjust your roll centers. So uh, pretty slick that you can not only do this for a lot less money than controlling the whole arm, but also have geometry correction at the same time. Now for my favorite part and probably your favorite part of any build and that is of course the wheel and tire package because what changes the look of your car more than a beautiful set of wheels and can I just say that these new Koenig heliograms are quite possibly the nicest flow formed wheel Koenig has ever made. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Classic like split five spoke design in a really nice, uh, I don't know what they call this color, I would call it sort of like a titanium or gunmetal-ish silver. It's got some nice metal flake in it and man, they just look so good. And of course, we've wrapped them in our favorite tire. This is the Continental Extreme Contact Sport. And this is the summer tire of choice here at Speed Academy because it is extremely good in every condition you can throw at it in a three season environment, basically, you could say. As far as specs go, we've gone with a 255, 35, 18 all around. However, we do have a staggered wheel setup. So this is the rear wheel in a 18 by nine and a half plus 35. And the front is an 18 by eight and a half plus 42. And as we've discovered, we probably could have gone a little more aggressive in the front had we rolled the fenders and maybe trimmed the rear fenders before it went off to body and paint. But we've done it again, PT. We forgot to do that before it went to body and paint. So we went a little conservative and offset just to make sure we would fit without rubbing. And I think you'll agree when you see these on the car that they are going to look really, really good. Welcome to the future here. And uh, I wanted to jump forward to talk about this. This is the Extreme Contact Sport 02, a brand new tire. We just did install the original Extreme Contact Sport on these wheels and tires, but unfortunately we didn't have these in time. So I really wanted to uh, touch base on these, mainly because there is a $70 prepaid visa being offered right now if you buy a set of Continental tire passenger tires and the new Sport 02 is on that list. And first of all, let's have a quick look here. The difference between these tires is this is essentially an evolution of the original Extreme Contact Sport. You can see they now have these 3D sipes in this area here. They have these macro blocks as well, which also stiffen up the sidewall here. This tire is actually one second faster around a racetrack than the original Extreme Contact Sport. That is with Conti's independent testing, I'm sure at their facility. So I actually had a chance to go down to Palm Springs, drive this tire on the racetrack in an NSX, um, and to see how it performed. And it was noticeably better. It feels more responsive. It has better turn in. It just feels like a better tire overall. I also had a chance to drive it. it through the LA streets and up Angeles Crest in a brand new G80 M3. And again, super impressed. They're low noise and they still perform like this truly is, uh, at least in my opinion, the best daily driver, ultra high performance tire you can get. And then if you want to go to the racetrack on the weekends, it can certainly do that too. So if you're interested in a set of these, certainly check the link in the description. We'll have a direct link over to their website where you can find a participating dealer that can sell you these. All right, now it is back to the past where we continue building this car. Just wrapping up the alignment here. And as you can see, we've gone with a 
kind of a mild street slash track alignment on it, two and a half degrees in the front, two, two in the rear, zero the toe out in the rear, and just put a tiny bit of toe out in the front to help with, you know, turn in response and all that good stuff. But we didn't go crazy with the alignment because this is not a crazy time attack build. This is really meant to be a nice street ripper with, you know, a performance alignment. So that's what we've given it. And the beauty of this chassis, like we told you before, is all those eccentric bolts under there make adjusting it so easy. You get really nice, fine control of it. And, uh, you know, it didn't fight us. There was nothing rusty or seized up under there because uh, Japanese car. So big win and man, this car is looking mega good now. So let's get it on the ground and shoot the beauties. You have it guys what do you think i am very pleased the way this thing is turning out i think it looks amazing with this color combination and we did put in a st suspension five mil spacer on the front to bring the offset of the wheel out so that it visually lines up better with the rear offset and i think right now we do have a really nice balanced look and as you can see we also put on this night sport or night sport style hood we're not sure if it's a genuine night sport hood or not but uh we like it for the venting because rotaries make heat and this will allow the heat to get out of there. We should say thanks to Tim who sent us these, I think really very clever plates that if you live somewhere where you don't need to run a front license plate, but this looks ugly without something in its place, he makes these in both a, like a gloss black or a carbon look. I think this might actually be a carbon plate that fills this space and looks really cool. We just have a little bit of sticky tape on the back of it right now so you can see how it looks on there. But I think it really cleans up the front end and lets the world know that you're rocking an RX-7. And if you want these, he does offer them. His Instagram account is OaklandFD3S. So hit him up on IG and uh, you can get these for your FD as well. So thanks for sending them over, Tim. Exciting times here. We are just about ready to start this FD up. Uh, we have Seamus from tailored chassis solutions on the line. Seamus is a, uh, you're an expert in FDs, right? You do a ton of these. You, you were able to like load a, a base map into our hall tech here and it looks like we're almost ready to go, right? Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got most of the things set up here. Um, you know, we had to go through and you, you guys have got, uh, you know, a myriad of sensors on here from, from uh, sort of all over the spectrum. Uh, it's for manufacturers and stuff, so we've got all of our calibrations and things done. We've got all our sensors scaled. Uh, we've put together sort of a uh, basics um, DE table here, uh, utilizing our size and flow characteristics of our injectors. Yeah. Um, so at this point, you know, I'm pretty confident that uh, are ready to get fired up. There's a couple of little things that I got to do uh, since you guys decided to go with the direct fire coil setup. Uh, just rework a little bit of the idle air control valve settings here, but okay. uh, I can get that stuff worked out and then I think we can uh, go for a first test fire. Sweet, and uh, DP, what's what's your percentage here as to this thing's gonna fire right up? Or is this one of those rotaries where you gotta like crank it a uh, hundred times, Seamus, and it's gonna go buh, 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 <laughs> I, I think it's going to fire right up, but, you know, I'm always the optimist. I've had my fair share of those in the past. <laughs> um, if, if we uh, have gone through and crossed our teeth and dotted our eyes appropriately, uh, I think that, uh, I think we're in for some pretty good luck on this. Sweet. One. All right. Okay. Well, uh, we'll be back here in, like, what, you probably need a couple minutes, and uh, let's crank the key over here and see what happens. Ah. 
So that is uh, the unfortunate downside to trying to start this car here. Uh, I, I thought I had the tube on here, but maybe I need to secure it properly to try that again. We have our uh, big ass fan fired up, which uh, hopefully will- Cool we'll, boss. That's right. We'll, we'll move some stuff around here, but uh, hmm. okay. Let's, uh, let's figure this out here. Well, there is uh, some serious bad news here. Nothing catastrophic, but we have a major oil leak, as you can see right here. So between the block and the oil pan, and at first I thought the oil pan wasn't sealed properly, but um, after talking to Joe, our engine builder, he mentioned that uh, these irons were nitride coated and in order to do that they had to like strip out all of like these little plugs that go into a lot of the irons and in when they do that what they do is they they uh put threads into it and then you can screw um you know countersink plugs into them and likely what has happened is there is no plug in here which is why it is gushing at such an alarming rate uh we did actually have one up front here leak as well on us that uh, when we originally just tried to pressurize the system, there was a, a ton of oil coming out. So we are leaning towards that. And of course, man, I'm just like gutted right now because to do this job isn't, you know, five bolts and you drop the oil pan. As you can see here, the entire subframe or engine has to come out. Like this pan to access these bolts, the engine mounts have to come out. The subframe has to come down. So it's, it's a butt ton of work and I'm not excited about it. So um, we're just gonna take a pause, we're gonna reset. I don't even know if we're gonna shoot footage of this because you know maybe we'll shoot a little bit to just confirm what, what's leaking, but to just go through all this is, it's gonna be like a day's worth of work, DP. So it sucks, but uh, you know, it's gotta be done at this point. So the oil pan is coming off. Yes, and look at this leak. Look at the size of this leak. I mean, it's sat here for about an hour and a half while I was crying in the, the back room thinking about this. But yeah, there is a, a, just a metric ton of oil all over the floor and we now have to clean it up too. Well guys, uh, I do apologize. <laughs> in the rush to get this done, we didn't actually shoot any footage showing what the issue was, but it in fact was, we did take a photo, the, uh, the plug for one of the oil ports was missing in fact. So um, we did just plug that up and we are now assembling everything back together. You can see we did drop the entire subframe down. It wasn't too bad a job. I thought it was gonna be way, way worse, but uh, we were able to just um, hold the engine up and then just drop the subframe. And here we are, you know, I think three hours later putting it all back together. So. Now, I'm, I'm very confident the next time we start this thing up, it's not going to have any oil leaks. With the mechanical side of this car essentially complete, man, what a feat and battle that was. Uh, we are moving on to the interior. And uh, much like the engine side of things, the interior on Mazdas and FDs in general is just... It's a bit of a nightmare too. The plastics break, they're hard to get. Like people 
buy entire cars to get full interior. So um, we're gonna make the best of, of what we have. Uh, the one thing I wanna note is uh, if you have an FDRX7 and you like us had a gauge cluster that wasn't working, ours was just like completely dead, not working at all. I'll post some photos of, uh, of all the, like the burnt transistors and like the capacitors and all the leads that were like so messed up on this. Um, I sent this off to uh, a fellow Canadian, Michael Gagne, and he ended up fixing this thing. And now this thing keys on, look at this, and works perfectly now. Other than this seatbelt, because it's it's touching somewhere, we don't have the seatbelts on, so it's probably uh, got a bad ground, but this now works and I can confirm that this car has 102,000 kilometers DP. Yeah. So this is actually, uh, pretty you know, mileage. A pretty low mileage. There's like 60,000 miles on it just over. So if uh, if you do have a cluster that is, you know, problematic or has any type of issues, that is a common thing. So you can send it off and, and get it repaired. So at this point, I think what we're gonna do is just slap this interior together and show you our finished product. There you have it. Interior is back together. Only took me like three or four hours, of course. Um, notable things we do, this car had this whole like center section was missing. I bought this new like little console here that locks and I guess is almost as a rest for your elbow. Uh, shifter wise, I honestly don't know what brand of shifter this is. Uh, it does have a Trust Gretti logo on the top of it. I don't think that's it, but I think it really looks good in the car. So we're gonna run with it. OEM steering wheel, of course clusters back in. Um, we had replaced uh, our, our broken center vent here. You can't get them from, from Mazda anymore. So this is actually a 3D printed one from, I think it's called Draco. He's like a, a small time guy that makes uh, 3D printed parts for FDs. Big win there. And uh, the most notable thing is I have upgraded our stereo system to an a Android head unit here from uh, Enon. This is of course got CarPlay. And you can see this one I, I particularly like because I see how quickly it loaded. So th that's a huge thing for me, having CarPlay r work remotely and having a, a system, a, a head unit that loads quickly like an Android one seems to be uh, uh, pretty cool. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with this, like it a lot. And you will see that we do not have the factory seat here and that is for good reason. If you've been in an FD or know of FDs, they have a very cramped cabin. And in order to get a race seat into this car, you're gonna want a very low seat bracket. And sadly, if you want rails to make it adjustable, it's for anybody around six feet or above, you're, it's just kind of impossible to do and have a proper driving position. So Adam Griffith actually makes this bracket, which is beautiful. I'll make sure to include his information in the uh, description if you guys are interested in this bracket. It is pretty amazing. It will get your race bucket down as low as possible. Uh, this particular model has been modified. This was originally for an XL, uh, which is funny. You'll find out in a second why. Uh, Dave told him we're gonna be running a uh, large seat, regular size, so he, he narrowed it for us and brought it in a bit. So uh, this would bolt in as such like that. And now let's uh, let's get the seat and I'll show you the problem we have. And here is our bucket race seat. This is from Buddy Club. This is their P1 limited edition seat. And this is actually a really affordable seat, great option. It, it contours very well to your body, holds you in. Um, we've run these in the past many, many years ago and like them quite a bit. They just aren't FIA certified. So that means you're not gonna be able to run them in a proper like rank, uh, ranked series or, or sanctioned series, but these are perfect for track days. And uh, this particular model is the large model. And guess what? I realized that large is actually the XL version for Body Club. They have a regular size. So as you can imagine, this seat will not fit on this bracket without having to like really massage it in place. You can see I have to kind of like bow it out, which is not proper. 
So therefore, we won't be able to run this seat in here, sadly. I'm kind of bummed, I'm gonna to have to order the regular version. However, it is winter time here. We had, we had high hopes to get this car to the racetrack and that's just not gonna happen because of the weather. So, I mean, bolting in the stock seat just makes more sense right now. So we're gonna put that in for the time being and then maybe in the future we'll go back to it. But uh, admire it because I think this would have looked super cool in here. Like, check that out, man. That would be like such a cool, FDS bucket seat in here. I can't get it to, to stay put, but look at that. Wouldn't that be so cool? Well guys, this episode is a wrap and I must say it is looking awfully nice in here and I really do like the stock steering wheel and the stock seat's very comfortable. You don't really need a racing bucket in here other than the fact that I just don't have a lot of headroom. And if I'm honest, for heel and towing, my knee is kind of hitting the steering wheel, but... You weren't built for an FD. Uh, I, 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 I'm a little girthy for this car, for sure. I'm not JDM size, but I've got the soul of someone who wants to be JDM size. So I'll, I will make it work, and PT, I think, will fit much better over here than I do. But overall, still pretty awesome to be sitting in here with like a, fun, a functional head unit, with functional gauges. You know, it's a complete car again. So that means that in the next episode, we're going to the dyno. We're going to make some power. And then, weather permitting, we're going to take this thing for a rip. So stay tuned for that, guys, because it's going to be good.